Thank you. All right. Well, we'll begin again. Um, there is a little quote by the Buddha that I wanted to read uh, to begin. It ties right into what we've been talking about. He says, Your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. And once mastered, no one can help you as much, not even a beloved mother or father. So I'll repeat that one more time. Your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. And once mastered, no one can help you as much, not even a beloved mother or father. And that really you know, kind of gets to the heart of the meditation practice is we become aware in the, in the deep meditation that we do in the beginning of, of uh, each week and that we cultivate as a practice in our own lives that we become aware of how our thoughts are having such an impact on, uh, on the way we feel uh, in general. And, um, you know, this week... Um, or, or over the past week, you know, there's been a lot of events in the world that, that we witness, you know, the, the tragedy of the migrants leaving Syria, and you were talking about that last week a little bit, and, you know, we see these people coming across trying to get away from the Civil War, and uh, many of them are dying in the process, and there's, you know, little children drowning, and we see that, and uh, it hurts, you know, it hurts to see that. Or, you know, like here in, in our community, there was a tragedy about a week ago. A, a mom and a child, you know, uh, were killed and, and, you know, terribly tragic, you know, terribly tragic. And there's a real, you know, there's a pain in the heart. You know, we just feel that. And there's this grief and this loss. And we see these things and we wonder, you know, what can we do? Um, the world's so big and we can feel so powerless. And I think there's this this natural feeling of compassion, but then added to the compassion, there's a little bit of this anger because we see these senseless things and we, we think, you know, how can there be such inhumanity? Um, there's some fear because, you know, I mean, these are things happening in our own world and, and you know, we, we fear that things like this can happen. And, and so there's some of that. And some of our reaction can be to start to close ourselves off a little bit. You know, I'm afraid of violence or I'm afraid of bad things happening. And so there's just a part of me, maybe it's not overt, but there's just a part of me that kind of maybe wants to close the door a little bit on, on uh, putting myself out there. You know, it's kind of this response to the uh, painful awareness of, of what can be happening. But I think the in line with the teaching that really what we need to do is the exact opposite is in that moments in those moments where we're feeling that um, that fear that pain that that broken heartedness at observing you know all the problems in the world around us that we're aware that our our natural habit tendency is to start to pull away to withdraw to close ourselves off to it and in doing that we sort of stop the the natural process of healing and interacting with our communities and interacting with the world around us and, and allowing ourselves to be available to help others to heal. And so sometimes we might think, well, what can I do? I'm one person and, you know, the Syrian crisis is happening on the other side of the world or, you know, this is a, uh, you know, these, these tragic deaths happen in the community and in a family that, you know, that, that maybe, um, we don't know personally and, and maybe can't do anything specific to help. However, really just this place that we cultivate in our own hearts and in our own lives where we cultivate this compassion, this openness to allowing ourselves to see injustice and to see inhumanity and to see what's going on around us and to recognize um, that these are difficult and painful things 
you really open yourself up to rather than a response of withdrawing and contracting and kind of wanting to push away this ugly stuff that you respond with love you know it just starts to open you up there's kind of these two ways you can go and so um, it's just a you know it's a part of the practice is to to recognize yeah you know I start to close off my heart because it's painful to observe this stuff it's painful to think about it but in closing myself off it's sort of like I stop that pain right here. This is where it stays. So opening up to it allows it to keep flowing through. Allows it to flow through, and it doesn't mean you stop caring, but it means you respond to it with love, compassion, openness, understanding. We talk about these issues. Maybe you can't do anything specific in Syria, but by talking about it, with others, you can maybe soften their hearts, open them up to it, and before you know it, minds are changed, you know, hearts are changed. It makes a big difference. So, um, always kind of the, you know, the best place to start is being aware of, you know, what are our thoughts doing to us? What are they, uh, where are they leading us? And noticing in some of these subtle ways how they close us off to the very thing we need to do, which is to open up. Um, the last couple of weeks we've been talking about Vipassana practice and this idea that our, our suffering uh, equals pain multiplied by resistance. And what I just talked about is kind of an example of that. That's we see, uh, we see pain, we start to resist it, you know, emotional pain, physical pain, whatever it is, we start to resist it and it starts to create suffering. We open up to it, we recognize it, we honor it, and then we're able to do something constructive with it. So we've been talking about that and getting into um, where we left off last week is, is to really um, start to get in touch with mindfulness of our experience. And that's a big part of what this practice is, is just letting yourself be aware of what is going on moment to moment in your own body, in your own mind, in your own heart. And it's to really notice that. According to the teaching, what happens when we aren't mindful is that we just sort of go on autopilot. We see things and we're reacting to them, often unconsciously, often in ways that are not helpful. So seeing seeing something we don't like and responding with anger or hatred or ill will. Now just think about that a little bit. Um, you, you see a news story or you hear about some event um, and your experience is I feel angry or I feel hateful or I feel intense ill will towards a person that harms other people or does you know does something violent to be aware of that is to kind of recognize hey I am having this experience of anger or hatred or ill will and I'm having it in conjunction with this other person or this organization or this event or war or injustice or whatever it is. But just being aware of that, there's so much to it. See, we think that we're sort of projecting that anger outward or we're projecting that ill will or that hatred outward. It, that's kind of our, our thought process is we're projecting that towards the thing that we're thinking about or the thing we're observing. But when we're mindful, we, we become aware of, no, this is just the feeling in here. So you can have hatred towards someone, but there's just hatred here. You know what I'm saying? You can have anger towards someone, but you know this is where anger lives. This is where the anger is experienced, and this is where the anger is felt. So mindfulness or awareness, same thing. Sati is the Pali word, S-A-T-I. Mindfulness or awareness is awareness of this. So that when there is anger or ill will, 
directed at someone or at something that even though we think we're directing it, it's really here. So we observe it. We, we actually just notice, yeah, this is what it feels like right here. And so we recognize that it's not a directional thing. You can't, you can't really project hate at someone when you're sitting and, you know, visualizing someone because you're the experiencer of hate. They're not. You feel it. You're the one that's experiencing it. Normally, when we're not aware of it on a level of sati, this mindful awareness, when we're not aware of that, we're reacting on the inside. Hate feels very unpleasant. Anger feels very unpleasant. We all know this because we've all felt it. Ill will feels unpleasant. Even when it's subtle, it just feels a little unpleasant. So we start to recognize that even when we're directing it at someone who maybe, you know, justifies our, our rage or our anger or our hatred, right, in every way because of something horrible that they're doing, um, we recognize that regardless of the reason that this is where the, the hatred or the ill will or the anger is experienced, right here. And when we're not mindful of that, uh, we're experiencing it on an unconscious level and we're reacting to our own anger and our own hatred and our own ill will um, by generating more and more reactions to it. And so this is kind of what I meant in the beginning by this, you start to see all these overwhelming images or read all these terrible news stories and you feel like you're just engulfed by it and there's feelings of anger and rage and heartbreak and, and fear and all these different things and you feel like you're engulfed by it all and in a sense it's because this is all happening in, in not a mindful way and so yeah you are engulfed by it and you are reacting to it on an unconscious level and you're creating more and more you know dis-ease and anxiety in your own body so according to the teaching um, the best approach is to be mindfully aware of it, aware at the level of attention, uh, surface level consciousness. So we're aware of how we feel about things. And in that, then we start to realize, oh yeah, you know, anger is just anger. Um, feels terrible. Fear is fear. Hate is hate. We, we can observe that. The next step is to be able to make it make our observation of that a little more objective. When we think that, kind of our natural, our habit way of referring to it is I feel anger or I feel hatred or I feel fear, right? And in part, that's just the convention of our language. That's how we communicate to each other. Um, because if, if you walked up to somebody and just said, fear, or fear is present, you know, they'd look at you like, what are, what, what is, what are you talking about? You know, is maybe there a policeman around that I can call or, you know, I mean, they would look at you kind of funny. So we have this convention in our language that I feel fear, or I feel anger, or I feel hatred. In a way, that, uh, that does not do us a service. Um, because more and more we personalize this. And from the perspective of the, um, the Dhamma teachings on this, uh, we're identifying more and more with the fear and the anger and the, and, uh, the hatred and all these um, unwholesome states of consciousness. Now for a second I want to make clear that I'm not talking about um, you shouldn't be outraged by children drowning you know, coming from Syria, or your heart shouldn't be broken by that. Um, or that, you know, if you become aware of violence in your community, that that doesn't, is not deeply disturbing to you. I'm not saying that you're not caring about these things. But what I'm saying that is on the, the level of dealing with these strong, difficult things in the world around us, we have to recognize this is where I deal with it. I am feeling anger, fear, hatred, animosity, all of those things, and that does not feel good. What does feel good is to recognize what is happening, to open your heart up to it, and then to cultivate whatever kind of compassion you can. 
you see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a, it's a transformation. You know, I'm not saying there's not a place for anger or outrage, but there is a place for transformation where we can convert those strong emotions into something that can be beneficial to us and to others, which is this compassion. But it starts by being aware of it. Um, the uh, I was kind of thinking two different thoughts there, so pardon me. Um, so becoming aware of it, and, and what I was talking about was also this not identifying with it too much on the level of this is me, I am this. This is where we feel it, but we don't, we don't need to identify with this as, you know, I am this person who is afraid, I am this person who is angry, I am this person who is hateful. Um, what we can recognize is that there is hate present that there is hate or there is anger or there is fear and acknowledge that, recognize it, but not make it a uh, something that we're uh, incorporating as part of our personal selves. Does that make sense? So it's letting go of these as our identity. And in that, you can recognize, yeah, there's anger, there's fear, What's the next step? What do I want to do with the anger? What do I want to do with the fear? Can I cultivate compassion for people who are in pain? Can I cultivate love for people who need it? Can I cultivate understanding for people who are confused? Anything. Can I cultivate any of these positive qualities? So again, we're not disputing how we feel and saying, oh, it's just in your head, it's an imaginary thing. Not saying that at all, just saying we're learning to look at it in a different way. Not to be afflicted by these things, but to be informed by them. This is the way I feel. Rather than reacting based on being immersed in hate or anger or fear, I will respond with wholesome reactions rather than afflictions. One way that we can do this and it's helpful is the suttas describe uh, the, the suttas that describe Vipassana practice they put forth this interesting assertion which is that our experiences which feel like one thing are actually made up of five different things or five aggregate parts and the five things happen in such rapid succession or in such a way as to overlap that they feel like they're one thing. So these are called the five aggregates. And this is in the handout. The five aggregates are form, consciousness, perception, feeling, and mental formation. Five aggregates. Now, according to the teaching, one or more of these five things, sometimes all of these five things, are what we kind of get attached to and identify with as me. This is who I am. And in fact, uh, there are five different things happening. And in Vipassana practice, we can actually start to look at them individually. And what that does is, is has a way of letting us see them objectively and impersonally and then noticing the point at which we would normally react to them and that's the moment that we can choose a skillful response. So when we talk about, oh and I wanted to share a quote, some of you have heard this quote before by Viktor Frankl. He was uh, a man who was in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II and uh, was in this horrific suffering. I don't remember which concentration camp it was, but horrific suffering beyond imagination. And he was pretty certain he was going to die there. And he realized really the last thing that he had that hadn't been, been taken away from him by his captors, the last thing he had was his own freedom of mind to think about what he wanted to think about. 
And so he kind of had this experience of, yeah, I, I, I realized that feeling hatred, even for these, these um, Nazi captors who were torturing all these people, he realized that even feeling hatred for them, he was the one who was experiencing the hatred. And that was uh, not how he wanted to feel. And so he set about to try and cultivate whatever love, compassion, kindness he could find beauty wherever he could cultivate it in this horrific setting. So his words were, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our freedom and our growth. And that's very much what we're talking about here, is becoming aware of that space and then choosing what we want to put in it. So I want to um, kind of read through some basic guidelines of Vipassana practice and then talk about it a little more just to make sure that people kind of have an understanding of how we might work with this. So what we do when we practice Vipassana, and again, Vipassana means insight. So think seeing in, seeing into what? Seeing into my own experience seeing into that in a way where I penetrate it deeply and I really start to understand what's going on here. So to begin Vipassana in meditation, um, the best approach is to start with just a normal meditation practice where you're doing a body scan, you're releasing tension, cultivating calm abiding in the body, cultivating quietness of mind. Why do you want to do that? Well, because that is the ideal uh, stage upon which to work with some of these difficult emotions to be able to recognize them without reacting negatively and to start to do some positive things with them. During Once you go into your Anapanasati, which is your breathing meditation phase, uh, you'll deal with the usual distractions. Things will come up. Sounds and physical sensations and aches and pains and thoughts and mental images and all this different stuff and to the extent that you can you just try and let go of those return to the breath a lot of that stuff will just go away by itself now there's going to be a few things that sort of stick around in a different way and we recognize those a lot of times by that's when we feel yeah something flashes there's a fear or something there's a memory of something very unpleasant or we think of something that might happen, just these little flashes, and there's, there's fear or anxiety or, um, uh, or anger or hatred or whatever it is. We feel that coming up, and those things sometimes, they just don't want to go away quite so easily. Maybe you can't just redirect your breath and let that stuff go. So those are some of the things that we'd want to work with in Vipassana practice. Those are our troubling, you know, kind of afflictive emotions. So those are the things those are the moments where, through mindfulness, we're aware that this is happening. And so, rather than be swept away by the fear, which in the case of fear, um, we maybe think about the worst thing that could happen, and then if that happens, what are we, how are we going to respond, what are we going to say, and pretty soon we've got this whole, you know, sort of orchestrated thing in our minds of what this could possibly be like. And then maybe that flashes us to something else, and then we're in that. And so when we're in that, we're really feeling all these horrible emotions as if it were really happening. Mindfulness is the thing that allows us to notice, oh, I'm doing that. That's happening. Very simple thing. But again, mostly we'd never notice. You know, We just go to that place, and we, uh, you know, we're doing that ruminating. We're doing that... Uh, thought tornadoes, we sometimes call them, are just rethinking that over and over, churning it up. Um, very unpleasant. So mindfulness, we become aware. Oh, there is that hatred. There's that fear. The reason that we might want to give it a name like that, note it, is in this case, so that we don't automatically just sort of grab onto it as this is part, you know, this is my identity but we recognize there's that subtle difference between I am feeling fear and there's fear. You know, fear has arisen. You can kind of feel that. 
It's not like you're uh, trying to ignore it or to deny it, but you're looking at it in a different way. There is fear. Now, fear is present. Fear has arisen. Not, I am fear, not I am afraid, or this is my identity. But, objectively, there is fear. So we, re we at that moment, we turn our focus of awareness on that afflictive emotion, fear. We turn our awareness on it and we observe it as a sensation. What are its characteristics? Now, this is a lot like the pain meditation and it seems kind of counter to what would make sense. Why do I want to focus on my fear? Well, because as soon as you focus on your fear, it brings clarity to it. Your seeing it with the wisdom mind. You're no longer reacting to it, at least not on the same level, that unconscious, you know, ruminating, thinking about uh, one thing after another after another, and pretty soon you're, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're really affected by it. But focusing on it allows you to clarify it and see it for what it is. And just that one thing starts to really make a difference. When we start to resist fear or pain, um, we think we're keeping it away, but we're actually locking it in right here. To be aware of it mindfully is to allow it to flow the rest of the way through. You know, and you can almost visualize that. Yeah, I feel fear, and I don't want to feel fear, so I resist it. Well, it's already in you. So resisting is just stopping the flow. It's locking it in. I don't want to feel fear. Well, you are feeling fear, and you've just locked it in here. To recognize there's fear. I'm not going to resist it. I am going to let myself observe this feeling of fear objectively. And I'm not going to identify it. I'm not going to uh, identify with it. I'm not going to resist it. I'm not going to crave something else. I'm going to observe it. Let me observe this fear. And you observe the fear. And the fear, in doing that, you allow it to flow through. Now I had shared um, kind of a personal story. Pardon me for a second. I shared a personal story about um, my, my mom who's 82 and called me and asked if I would uh, if I would uh, accompany her to make her funeral arrangements for when she passes away and um, and I, I said I would do it and I got off the phone with her and uh, um, we'd agreed to talk later but she just kinda wanted to bounce the idea off me so I got off the phone with her and I felt myself right away feeling horrible. Feeling kind of a combination of fear, um, anger, anxiety, upset, all these different emotions. Just feeling all of that. So right away I recognized this is something I need to really take a look at. This feels very icky. You know, just in a split second I realized this. So I sat down and I, I meditated. Um, I just happened to be at home. I was upstairs alone. I had an opportunity to do that. So it was a wonderful time um, to sit and just be with these very difficult emotions. So I sat down, got uh, centered in my posture, went through my body, um, kind of did a brief body scan, um, calmed, quieted a little bit, focused on my breath for a few minutes, got centered, and this feeling of agitation um, and fear and all these other difficult emotions, they were there. And so I just let them come. And what was the experience? What am I feeling here? Anger. Um, what is the sensation of anger? I let myself feel it rather than pushing it away. What else am I feeling? Fear. What else am I feeling? Anxiety. Um, observing all these sensations as they're coming up and, you know, waiting to see what 
what comes next? You know, there was kind of one after another, after another, after another. But in sitting there and just waiting, observing, not, uh, not getting swept away by it, being objective and letting it move through my consciousness, it was like none of that stuff was sticking to the extent that it would normally stick. So I started to see real clearly, at least in my case, you know, here's here's my mom calling and uh, she wants to get together and, you know, plan the funeral. And there's a part of me that's scared of that, you know. I don't want to see my mom die and I don't want to think about death in general. I don't want to face, you know, I'm. this is what I'm sort of realizing is coming out of all this. This is what's behind these emotions. And it was only in the really letting that stuff come up and looking at it objectively that I was able to observe it at that level. Because otherwise it's just, boy, I feel really, really awful and panicky and angry and icky and so, you know, I want to go have a drink or I want to go do something to distract myself, you know, whatever it is. But instead it was just, you know, let me be with this objectively. Uh, let me observe this as it is. And it was amazing to just kind of watch all that stuff settle and kind of open up into this, so what's left, you know? what's left is kind of this, all right, I feel, you know, compassion. I feel love uh, for my mom. I feel compassion for myself, for my own fear, and I want to do this thing and I want to help her. We got together. We did that that uh, planning, um, picked out her urn, went to the grave site, talked about the inscription on the tombstone, did all those things. I cried a couple of times. Um, it was a very emotional experience. It was very moving. But because I was just sort of open to it the whole time, letting these emotions just move through and not resisting any of it, um, it was as if it was able to just pass through, moving through uh, consciousness as opposed to locking it in and holding it here. Does that make a little bit of sense? Um, you know, these things are really different for everybody, obviously. but. Um, it's this opening up to it and letting it be there in a, in a way that you would just normally not. And it's transformative. Because you're not letting your mind go to the worst case scenario. You're not letting yourself react to your own afflictive emotions. But you're looking at things objectively and with a clear mind and you're responding uh, in a wholesome way, in a healthy way, for you and for everybody else around you. So we had that uh, we had that experience, and it was you know it was beautiful. It was a difficult thing. It was tough to tough to have that. But we went and had like a three hour lunch after that, and talked about all sorts of things, and it was really wonderful. Um, and at the end of that, she said, you know, I feel so much better. I feel so relieved just having done all this and it was the same thing I was feeling because what we did is we went and faced it there's the urn there's the there's the cemetery there's the tombstone you know here's where the words are going to be inscribed and all these different things and she was able to see that and know that it was done and be at peace with it and I was able to be there with her and be at peace with it now hopefully we don't have to deal with that actually happening for many many years but I also feel like now I'm in a place where when others are grieving, when the time does come, that I will be available in a way that maybe I wouldn't have been available, you know, that I'll be able to, you know, really share. Um, and it was kind of neat because, you know, it was, uh, we had this time to talk to each other, you know, mom and son. Um, it was very beautiful. And, uh, I dropped her off at home, and there, it was about rush hour, so um, so I, I there was some construction. So I decided to take kind of a route through uptown in Minneapolis, and uh, 
you know, just thinking of all the things my mother's done for me over the course of my life and, and uh, all that. And I came to a stoplight in Uptown, and there was a woman, a uh, fairly young woman, holding a sign. You know, we see those signs, and, and she said, uh, um, I need, I need, um, please help me help my son. Something like, something like that on a cardboard sign. You know, so she was hoping for, hoping for some money. I came to this, it happened to be a red light, so I was there. And, um, uh, and I saw her, and, and it was just kind of funny to see this, you know, mother holding a sign, help me help my son. And it was like, wow, you know, there she is doing anything she could for her son, wanting to help him. And it was, it was just sort of like this whole thing went full circle. You know, here's me seeing sort of my mother, in a sense, standing on the corner with a sign saying, help me help my son. And I thought, oh, you know, my mom, she would have done that for me if she needed to. And so I went, in a way, it was almost like helping my own mom you know, just kind of this this neat thing. So I was able to share a little something with her just because I happened to be at this red light. Normally, you know, if traffic had been sweeping through, that you know, what can you do? But uh, I just happened to be there. So it was kind of a neat thing. Um, and then I wept again after that. I was driving down Hennepin Avenue, wiping tears out of my eyes. and uh, But it was beautiful, you know. There was no fear in it anymore. There was no anxiety. It was, you know, here we are. Here we are. So opening up to those afflictive emotions, really looking at them in a way that's compassionate, in a way that's objective, allows us to see them for what they are, not as we fear them to be. Um, so hopefully this is, is making some sense. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, yes. The um, uh, to to recite each morning, not in a pessimistic way, but in a way of recognizing objectively the truth of um, uh, I am of the nature. Uh, to grow old. I am of the nature to have ill health. I am of the nature to die. All that is dear to me and everyone I know are of the nature to change. I cannot escape being separated from them. And finally, my actions are my only true possessions. They are the ground upon which I stand, the five remembrances. So yeah, they do tie into this in a very real way when we look at, you know, this is the truth of life. And those are some pretty heavy kind of things that we would normally, boy, my reaction to that is, no thanks. I don't want to have anything to do with that. I'd rather, let me, you know, let me do something else. Um, so to recognize, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the truth. I recognize that I will grow old. That's one of the things that I'm normally afraid of, right? I recognize that I'll have ill health, something we're afraid of. I recognize that I'll die, something we're afraid of. Um, everyone around me is going to change getting older, they will get sick, they will pass away, they will move to other parts of the country where I maybe won't be able to see them or, you know, these kinds of things. Or, uh, uh, you know, stuff that I love now, um, you, you know, it's not going to last forever. Uh, even as simple as summer is coming to an end, it's going to be winter again soon. I mean, everything is in this constant state of change. Everything is just flowing. Everything is in a flux. And when we try and resist that or deny it or get away from it, that's when we start to feel uh, out of balance. 
You know, that's the opposite of equanimity. Whereas equanimity is recognizing all of that and saying, yes, this is the nature of all of life. The whole universe is this way. And so, what is that reminding me to do? Well, it's reminding me to cherish every moment I've got and to recognize that when I'm angry, all I'm doing is feeling anger in here. And so when I can be aware of that, I can let it go, and instead I can cultivate compassion. Um, because after all, things like anger are a response to something that needs compassion, right? I mean, when you're angry about something, there is a situation there that needed more love, needed more compassion, needed more understanding, needed more wisdom. The four Brahma Viharas we talk about, compassion, right? Loving kindness, joy, and equanimity. All of these things that we get angry about, get hateful about, are fearful about, what they all need is that. They all need us to open up so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying so, you know, go put yourself in harm's way or anything like that. But every one of these things, we either respond with these afflictive emotions, or c we can respond with emotions that will set us free. So, um, just going back to that quote in the beginning: "Your worst enemy." cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. And once mastered, no one can help you as much, not even a beloved mother or father. So when you think about guarding your thoughts, sometimes it's, it's uh, referred to as guarding the six sense doors, you know, the stuff that we experience through sight, smell, sound, taste, touch or thought guarding the sense doors it's not that we're not um, it's not that we're closing ourselves off but what we're doing is we're we're present we're mindful of what's coming in so when we see things that make us angry or make us respond in those ways we're aware we're mindful and in that mindfulness we can actually do something with it um, All of it ties together. A couple of keys on this effective observation in Vipassana. Um, the first one is it is here. And here being in the framework of the body and mind. So this is what we're observing. We're observing what is here in the framework of the body and the mind. So when, we're, when our attention gets drawn out to other things, um, there might be anger or outrage about an event out there that, that caused the anger in here. So in the, in the meditation practice, we're going to let go of the outside stuff and we're going to focus on the anger that's in here. Does that make sense? So it's not, you don't need to bring into this framework thoughts about some violent act or thoughts about some horrific thing. What you're, what you're doing is being aware of what's happening in the framework of the body. So if there's anger, you know, this is what you're working with, the reality within the framework of the body and the mind. So letting go of the outside stuff, focusing on what's in here. Here in the framework of the body and mind. And I'll read what I have here. Um, it might be helpful. Many of our disturbing experiences come from things occurring in the world around us. And even though the things occur outside of us, the unpleasant experience occurs here in the framework of the body-mind complex. Focusing here, turning the senses inward, helps us reduce the amount of negativity we are consuming. And it puts us squarely in the one and only place we can work with it. 
So does that make some sense about just sort of letting go of the negative images or the news stories or the events? Letting go of those temporarily and working with what's here in the framework of the body. The result of those stories is anger, fear, you know, whatever it is. And so we're going to work with that here. The next one is now. Not in the past or the future, but in the present moment. Painful emotions like sadness, grief, guilt, and anger are triggered by thoughts about the past. So try to maintain awareness in the present moment. Painful emotions like fear, worry, and anxiety are triggered by thoughts about the future. So again, try to maintain awareness in the present. So you're going to be here in the framework of what's happening within the body and the mind. You're going to be now. What's happening now? Not what did happen, not what might happen, but just what's happening right now. So here and now, and then the next one is do it objectively. Objectively is another way of saying not making it part of your identity. The more we personalize anything, the more attached we become to it, and the bigger the impact it will have on us. Obviously, difficult emotions are ours in the sense that they are our experience. But knowing that implicitly, try to let go of it and observe the impersonal nature of the experience. So sure, you can say, this is my pain and my fear and my anger, and I'm not going to pretend it isn't. You know, that's sometimes the response that we have to this is like, you're telling me that I, I this isn't my anger or my fear? Uh, you know, don't, don't tell me that it isn't. But in these situations, we are really saying, I'm not ready to let go. But that is attachment. Right? That is attachment. And attachment makes every difficult feeling more intense. So just the mere fact that, hey, I'm not ready to let go of this, I am angry, I am fearful, okay? Um, there's a way that you can honor your anger, your fear, your past experiences, your history, all of those things. There's a way you can honor those, but not take them on as a part of your permanent identity. And that's what this teaching is talking about, is that what we take to be our permanent identity is often not helpful because usually it contains all these, you know, all these things that, that cause us to be angry and fearful and hateful. So saying I'm not ready to let go, um, that is attachment and attachment makes every feeling more intense. Ironically, being attached to pleasant experiences does not make them more intense or more pleasurable. It only sets the stage for more intense disappointment when the pleasurable thing inevitably changes or comes to an end, and it decreases our ability to enjoy it here and now. So all of this is about just cultivating this equanimity. The more equanimous you are, uh, the more non-resistant, the more unconditionally releasing you are to all of these things as they flow through you, the longer you know happiness remains with you, um, the, the more possible it is for all these negative afflictive emotions to pass through you. The next one is to remain attentive, which means to observe everything at the surface level of consciousness. As a result, nothing will occur, occur at the unconscious level and all of your experiences will unfold with complete clarity. No ignorance, no delusion. And then equanimously. All sorts of thoughts, feelings, and sensations will be coming and going. Let them flow right through you. Don't resist or react to any of it. Imagine the six senses are like conduits 
through which experiences pass. Don't interfere with anything passing through these conduits. Maintain the perfect balance of the mind and just allow these experiences to flow through. You're looking at them clearly, here, now, objectively. Um, you are remaining attentive and you are remaining equanimous. And in this you're observing these difficult, afflictive emotions and you find that, yes, you're able to deal with them in a much, uh, much more skillful way. It really starts to soften the experience. Does this make sense? Any questions on it? That is when it's harder for all of us. Yeah, you know, just in the heat of the moment, you know, it's uh, it's what happens is is that we talk about the 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 five aggregates, and the fifth aggregate is um, mental formations, or a lot of times I refer to them as reactions. Sankara is the word. Um, those become real patterned responses to different types of stimulus. Um, you know, so if you're in the habit of getting irritated by a certain thing or offended by a certain thing or whatever it is, you know, this is just sort of the normal pattern. Well, that's going to, when um, in the heat of the moment, that's what's going to come up. You know, that's what's going to come out of you is that sankara energy is what's going to arise. The more you work with it um, under like the best circumstances, laying in bed in the morning or doing meditation practice, what you're doing is you're starting to um, eliminate those old sankaras, those old habit energies. You're starting to eradicate them one at a time, one at a time, and replace them with this new habit energy or this new response which is to approach things with a little less anxiety or a little less anger or being offended or whatever it is, just that conflict stuff. Um, you'll really start to notice that and sometimes it'll catch you by surprise because something will happen, you'll recognize, boy, normally this would have really triggered me to be upset, yeah, react in a negative way. And I find myself kind of reacting with, I'm just opening up and instead I'm smiling at somebody or I'm saying, you know what, yeah, you're right. Um, or, yeah, that's fine, let's do it that way. Or, you know, you're kind of recognizing in the big scheme of things, this isn't, this isn't a real big deal, you know, compared to the five big recognitions of getting older and you know, having ill health and passing away eventually and everyone changing and everything happening and um, but ultimately where, I, where I'm left is you know my actions, my words, my thoughts, that's what I own. That's what I get to, to keep with me and that's really what I'm going to live in. Um, so it's, it's real recognition of that. But yeah, working with it in the simplest ways at first in bed, on the cushion. It takes time. Yeah, it takes time, but boy, it really works. Um, and before you know it, then it'll be simple things. Um, you know, I've had, I've had experiences where, you know, I've kind of pulled up to the street corner and there's been the, the homeless person holding the sign and I felt uncomfortable. Like, oh, you know, you kind of can't wait for that light to turn green, right? Because you feel, yeah, you know, it feels weird, right? Um, but to to be able to have that experience and just see, oh, you know, there's a woman, like, you know, I can fast, I can I can rewind the clock 50 years, and you know, there's there's my my mom, um, and the son is me, and so it. Yeah, yeah, the, the reaction is just completely different, you know, and it felt good. And so as I drove away, you know, kind of weeping, um, I, uh, 
you know, that felt wonderful. It wasn't sadness. It was tears of just sort of the beauty of all of this, you know. And I don't know what her circumstances are. I can't know. Um, what I know is I did what I could and, you know, left her with hopefully a memory of just, you know, one second of someone being compassionate. That's a wonderful thing to leave somebody with. But yeah, you just find that that stuff starts to fall away the more you practice with it. Because you're creating this new intention. You know, something's going to be here. What is it going to be? I feel anger. I guess I'd like to let that go. Can I feel compassion or love or kindness or patience or just see the absurdity of all this stuff and kind of let it go and laugh about it? So, well, I think we should end it here. We're, we're out of time. Um, so let's just take a couple of minutes to to do the four Brahma Viharas, cultivate that. Very real thing. And this is so important. This is why we end with it every week and that we focus on it continually is because, yeah, um, we can talk about, okay, well, if I let go of my fear and my anger and my worry and these kinds of things, well, then what? You know, then what? Well, what we will have in place of the fear and the anger and the worry is compassion, loving kindness, empathetic joy and just joy in general and equanimity, peacefulness and freedom. So just taking a couple of minutes now thinking, feeling within, letting ourselves sit in this real feeling of may all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering and letting that be as unconditional as possible you know so not knowing people's circumstances I don't know how people got into trouble or into difficulty um, you know some people I know some I know some about my own circumstances and what I do know is that yeah, people, human beings make mistakes, but may all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. And may all beings be surrounded by love and joy. And that may seem like a utopian thing, and maybe it is, but, you know, I guess utopia has to start somewhere. And so may all beings be surrounded by love and kindness. And may all beings be happy, joyful. And we can see their joy as our own joy, just as good as our own joy. It is our own joy. A smile on a child's face is a smile in our hearts. It's not their smile, it's our smile, it's our joy. And finally, may all beings be peaceful and free and equanimous, which means they're in a state where they're able to let go of attachment and aversion and all of the afflictive emotions enough to really see clearly and be completely liberated and free. And may you in this room sharing this space with me tonight, may you all be truly, truly happy. Namaskar, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.